Hey, financial accounting students. I'm so glad you've decided to start your accounting adventure with me. We're gonna work through the chapter one lecture today, and I'll warn you, it's a really long one. I'm gonna to try to break things down as simply as possible, um, but it's probably a lecture that you might wanna refer back to in the future. Um, chapter one, and I could say the same of chapters two and three as well, are gonna be essentially your foundation for the remainder of the semester. And these building blocks on the foundation are extremely important. So if there's something that you don't get, always feel free to refer back to this lecture and watch little parts over again to help solidify some of the information. So let's get started. So first we want to understand how to collect, collect and organize our information or our accounting data or transactions. Um, before we can even do that, we need to understand what accounting is. For many of you, You've never taken accounting. You don't quite know what it is. You know it has something to do with business. That's why most of you are here, um, because you need to take a couple accounting courses as part of your business administration degree, most likely, not all of you. Um, but some of you don't even really have a clear understanding of what accounting is. And I'll tell you, when I was a college student in my first semester of accounting, I felt the same way. I knew it was all about the numbers and the money, but you know, how do we really define that? People ask me all the time for a definition of accounting, and I really don't, I'm not a huge definition person. I'm not into memorizing definitions. You'll learn that about me throughout the term. Um, I don't need you to memorize definitions, um, but the way I can most simply explain accounting, it's a system of organizing data, financial transactions, summarizing them, and then providing a system of reporting that we call financial statements that provides important information to the users or the readers of the, those financial statements so that they can make decisions. So it starts with organizing and collecting that financial information and then we're going to figure out how to record it and then turn it into financial statements and eventually how to read and understand those financial statements. So we'll get a little taste of all of that today. So how does our society use accounting? What do we use it for? So here the textbook suggests the role of accounting is that it provides useful information in answering questions about resource allocation. And that could be how should you personally allocate your resources or within a business? So they give an example here. Accounting would help you answer the question, should I invest my money in IBM or General Motors? Neither, both, something else. Should I invest in Amazon or Google or Tesla? Not sure. And so that, that would relate to you making personal decisions about your money resource allocation. And in order to answer those questions, you would need to understand the financial statements of the company. So we'll learn a little bit about how to read financial statements. We need to know what we're looking for. What, what makes a company financially healthy? So as we go through the semester, we'll be learning more and more about how to read financial statements and understand if a company's healthy. Um, aside from that, within a business, we need to be able to make decisions about resource allocation. Um, we're anticipating a huge um, increase in our sales for next year, and we have only a certain amount of money in the bank, and we're expecting a lot of new sales, which is exciting, but what do we need to do to get ready for that? Do we need to hire more employees? Do we need to buy more equipment? Do we need more trucks to make deliveries? Do we need more support on customer service? Do we need, need another warehouse to store our inventory? So a lot of different possibilities there. Um, so we need to understand how to plan and how to answer those types of resource allocation questions in accounting. So we'll learn a lot of that this semester and that'll tie into managerial accounting, which hopefully you'll be taking next semester where we'll, where we'll look at using financial, excuse me, we'll look at using accounting data to make internal managerial decisions as well. So talking about terminology in accounting, there's a few terms that you're gonna hear over and over. Here's one at the top that I don't wanna spend an immense amount of time on, the term market is a group of people or entities organized to exchange items of value. So when we talk about the market value of something or um, you know, exchanging something, we have to assume that there's a market for that, that we're able to get money for what we're selling, if that makes any sense. 
Um, again, not a definition you need to memorize, but you'll understand as we um, use it in the context of the course. And then these other three terms at the bottom, I want to spend just a moment on profit, income, and earnings. Those are three words that you're likely going to hear over and over throughout the semester. Um, and they're all kind of similar, right? Do you feel like those words all have similarities? Um, if I told you that, that our company had a huge profit last quarter, does that mean the same as our company had a lot of income last quarter? Are those quite the same? Profit would imply that that's revenue minus expense and we had positive net income. There I am using income in there. Um, so profit implies that our revenue exceeded our expenses. If I say we had a lot of income or I could even say we had a lot of earnings, I'm not clear if we've already subtracted our expenses out of that yet. So I'm not going to hammer you guys with definitions of these terms. I just want you to be aware of them because we can all acknowledge that they have some similarities, but there's also some minor differences and nuances in how we use those terms. So pay attention to how I use the words, pay attention to how your textbook uses the words, and let's see if we can figure out how to speak uh, intellectually about business and accounting. And of course, that's one of my goals for you this semester that you're not afraid of the terminology, that you can speak intellectually about business and accounting topics and sound as educated as you actually are. So just pay attention. It's not about memorizing definitions for me. Financial resources. Really, when we talk about financial resources, for the most part, we're talking about money, right? So here they suggest conversion agents need financial resources, meaning money, to establish and operate their business. And there's two sources of financial resources. So here's the two. The first one is an investor, and the second one is a creditor. So what's an investor? An investor is somebody who puts their money into the business and in exchange, they get some amount of ownership in the business. It could be a little tiny fractional amount, a little 1% ownership. It could be the whole business. It could be half the business. But they put their money in to become an owner of that business. What do they want back? Well, they want the business to be successful. And eventually, they're hoping that the profitable business will be able to pay them out dividends and the value of their ownership in the business will go up over time and potentially they might be able to sell it. Um, in a corporate context, which that's primarily what we're talking about this semester, we're looking at um, accounting for corporations. In a corporate context, the investor could also be called a stockholder, shareholder. Those terms mean the same thing. So investor, owner, stockholder, shareholder, that all means the same thing. People that put their money into the business in exchange for some amount of ownership. And in the long haul, they want to be able to receive dividends if the company is successful and they'd like to see the value of their ownership in the company go up over time so that if they potentially sold their ownership, they would make money on it. If we think of this in the context of the stock market, we'd like to invest our money into a company and that makes you a small fractional owner of that company. And we want to see the value of that stock go up over time. We want to buy low and sell high and make money on that investment. So when you invest in the stock market, you're actually buying ownership in a corporation. When it comes to creditors, that's our other source of financial resources. Those are lenders. Those are people or other businesses, maybe a bank that loan money to your business. So what do creditors want back? Well, they want to get their money back plus interest. So both investors and creditors want to see the business succeed. They've put their money into that business and they want something in return. For an investor, it's dividends and the increase in the value of the company. For creditors, they put their money in. They want to be paid back, which is called principal, they want to be repaid the money that they loaned, and then they'd like to receive interest on top of that. So they're not loaning the money for free, but a creditor is different from an investor in that they want to be paid back plus interest. So 
Most often we're talking about banks or lending institutions in that case. So next we have physical resources. Depending on what type of business we're talking about, the physical resources of that business could really be anything. Here they tell us in the most primitive, primitive form, physical resources are what we call natural resources. So if we're talking about a company that makes furniture, that starts with wood, which comes from trees. So that's a natural resource. But a lot of businesses don't actually utilize directly natural resources. They use them somewhere down along the line, but maybe they don't use natural resources. Um, so depending on what the business does, their physical resources could be quite different. My accounting firm, we don't have a whole lot of physical resources. We have computers and desks and printers and filing cabinets and pencils and calculators and paper and, you know, a handful of different office supplies. Those are our physical resources. But if you're running a big manufacturing company, your physical resources would be a lot different than my little accounting firm. So you'd have a big factory facility and all the machinery. You might have trucks and forklifts and you might have a storage warehouse. You might have delivery trucks. Then you'd have some kind of corporate office with your computers and office supplies and all of that. So depending on what the business does, your physical resources could be quite different. Here they tell us owners of physical resources seek to sell those resources to profitable businesses which are able to pay higher prices and make repeat purchases. Now, I will be the first one to point out things in textbooks, whether it's this textbook or any textbook, that I don't entirely agree with. Um, I think this textbook sometimes is guilty of making big, broad, sweeping generalizations, which are sometimes true, but sometimes not. And this is the first one. Owners of physical resources seek to sell those resources to profitable businesses, which are able to pay higher prices and make repeat purchases. Well, yeah, sometimes, but sometimes owners of physical resources will seek to sell those resources to anybody. They don't discriminate as to whether your business is profitable or not. They just want to make a sale and be able to collect the money. Um, ideally, in a great business relationship, sure, you're selling to other profitable businesses and you build a relationship, a business relationship, and there's repeat purchases, but that doesn't always happen. So again, big, broad, sweeping generalization. Definitely there's some truth to it, but it's a sometimes, but not always. But anyhow, the big point here is we need to understand what physical resources are and probably most importantly, that they can vary vastly depending on what type of business that we're in. So next we have labor resources. Um, labor resources include both physical labor and intellectual labor. Um, definitely in the U.S. economy, uh, we have shifted from a lot of physical labor involving farming and manufacturing um, over the past century to a lot of intellectual and service type labor. Um, so there's definitely been a shift in our type of labor, but it doesn't matter what type of labor it is, it's still labor resources. It's the work that people do. And again, here our wonderful textbook makes a big sweeping generalization. Workers seek relationships with businesses that have high earnings potential because these businesses are better able to pay high wages. Hmm. Well, that would be nice, but sometimes people seek relationships with any business that will hire them. If the job market's rough, they'll take a job anywhere. Um, they're not only seeking to work for businesses that have high earnings potential, but there's definitely a point there. So again, it's a big statement, but I'd say sometimes, but not always. But think about this. If I were to offer you a job as a manager at Sears, and you'll get paid um, maybe $25 an hour to be a manager at Sears, and um, you'd have you know a certain level of responsibility. It's a, it's a decent job. And then there's another job offer though, and you could be a janitor at Google. So a manager at Sears or a janitor at Google. The janitor at Google, that job pays minimum wage, right now maybe $15 an hour. Um, 
What do you think? Which one would you take? So Sears is going to pay you $25 an hour to be a manager, while Google's going to pay you $15 an hour to be a janitor. Now, usually I get students say, hey, I don't care. I want to take the job at Sears. It pays a lot more, $25 an hour, and I'd much rather be a manager than a janitor any day of the week. Sure, I hear you. Um, make the money. It's being offered to you. And, you know, the reason I put Sears out there is that they're really in bad condition and will probably disappear entirely soon, right? Um, we're talking bankruptcy and dissolution. They're not going to be around for long. So that's kind of a dead end job. It's not going anywhere, but at least it's a management position you could put on your resume and you'll be paid more. Other people will make the argument no, 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 I'm going to take the janitor position at Google. Google is a solid company. They make a lot of money. They're known for treating their employees well. I mean, they certainly work hard. They work a lot of hours, but they're known for treating their employees well, and they definitely have a future. So maybe if I take the janitor job at Google and I work really hard, I can work my way up and have you know a much better job and a salaried position at Google. Um, I don't have to forever be a janitor. Um, but that would be a great company to get your foot in the door and connect with the right people and impress them with your work ethic and work your way on up. So again, I don't entirely agree with their statement here, but you can see why this would be a sometimes not always. Workers seek relationships with businesses that have high earnings potential because these businesses are better able to pay high wages. Yeah, if we can work our way up the ranks at Google, that might pay off for us. So next we're gonna talk about different types of accounting. This semester you're studying financial accounting and it's gonna be focused on the needs of external users. And those external users, usually we're talking about the investors and the creditors. Remember our two sources of financial resources? Those folks, before they invest in our company or before they loan money to our company, they wanna take a look at our financial statements and understand what's going on. What are they getting into? So financial accounting is mostly going to be focused on uh, accurately recording our accounting transactions and then turning them into financial statements that will be used by those external users. Next semester in managerial accounting, you're going to be studying accounting for the needs of internal users. So we're going to look at all kinds of different ways to break down our accounting data. We're certainly going to use financial accounting in managerial accounting. That's why we take it in sequence. Um, but we're going to look at all kinds of ways to use our financial accounting and a lot of other accounting data and slice and dice those numbers all kinds of different ways so that we can make good internal decisions within our company. And managerial accounting will be primarily focused on planning, uh, planning controlling, and decision making within the company. So not the external folks, but the internal users. What about nonprofits? So here they say non-business resource allocation. Um, I take issue with the term non-business. Um, nonprofits or not-for-profits or charitable organizations, however you want to call them, um, are businesses but they're businesses that are not necessarily motivated by making a profit. Um, they're motivated by serving some type of cause. So here they tell us not all entities allocate resources based on profitability. That's exactly right. Organizations that are not motivated by profit are called not for profit. So um, we've got the government, which actually falls in this category. Uh, foundations, religious groups, and then they get specific and they list the Peace Corps, which is kind of strange. Another example would be the Red Cross, Salvation Army, um, but there's tons of charitable or benevolent organizations that are not motivated by profit, but rather by serving a particular cause. Um, so to think about different charitable organizations, they can qualify to be what the government recognizes as a nonprofit, which doesn't have to pay taxes. That's called a 501c3 organization. I know a lot of 
IRS code there for you. Um, but a 501c3 organization has to essentially apply to be that, to get out of paying taxes, but they still are a business. They still have to have accounting. They still file a tax return. They just don't pay any tax, but they definitely have to be accountable. So they operate as a business. They're actually a corporation, um, but again, they're not motivated by profit. They might be, or they might be organized specifically to uh, help the homeless, um, help veterans um, to support youth and sports or some kind of health purpose. Um, there's a long list of different uh, causes that you can qualify to be a nonprofit or a charitable organization. And you have to apply to the government to get that status, to make it um, free from tax where people can donate to your organization and take a tax deduction for that. Um, I'm spending a moment on this only because when I was a college student, I never really thought of charitable organizations as a business or even a career possibility. But I think some of you out there might have a cause that maybe you're really passionate about and maybe you haven't really thought about making that a career. Um, if you have some amazing idea for a nonprofit and something that you really care about, you might be able to turn that into a business idea. Again, not motivated by profit, but by serving that cause that you care so much about. And as the manager or director of that nonprofit, you can draw a reasonable salary, you can make a decent living, and spend your work days serving that cause that you care so much about. So I think sometimes people don't really think of that as a career, but maybe just something they do with their with their extra time, their free time to serve or volunteer for that charitable cause. But sometimes you've got to plant some seeds that somebody's got to come up with those ideas and run those nonprofits. So maybe that's you. So as we talk about different types of accounting, um, financial accounting, again, um, mostly who cares? Investors, creditors, and here they throw in brokers. And what they're referring to is stock brokers, people that advise others on what companies they might want to invest in. So that would tie in with the investors. In managerial accounting, who cares about our accounting? Managers within the business, employees within the business, and they even throw in unions. And what they're referring to is employee labor unions. Um, sometimes those unions have access to some of the internal accounting information that's used to make decisions and used to negotiate with the company to make sure that employees' best interests are being looked out for. And then we have nonprofits. So like I said, nonprofits need accounting. They still run like a business um, and they're accountable to their benefactors and beneficiaries. What does that mean? Well, benefactors are those that give to the organization and the beneficiaries are those who benefit from the work of that organization. Um, legislators, meaning the government, the government is gonna check in on these nonprofits and make sure that they're doing what they say that they're going to do, serving that charitable purpose, serving that cause that they care about um, because they've given them a tax-free status. So the government certainly cares. And then they throw in citizens, really meaning anybody in the community that um, you know is affected by this nonprofit organization. So next I want to touch quickly on careers in accounting. Some of you have come to accounting class begrudgingly. You already have decided that you don't like accounting and you don't want to do it and you only are here because you have to be to get your degree in business administration. All right, that's fine. Understood. Fair enough. I'm still glad you're here. Um, and some of, some of you have come to this course thinking, I want to be an accountant. And some of you are like, I don't even know what to think. I don't even know what accounting is. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to like it or not like it. So I just want to plant some seeds with you. Um, some of you are going to find out that you're great at accounting, but you hate it. Others are going to find out that you are not very good at accounting, but you're trying to like it. And others of you will have that magical combination that you're both great at accounting and you love it. And if you fall in that category, I definitely want, want to encourage you to explore different careers in accounting. Um, to break it down real simply, 
we divide it into two categories, meaning public accounting and private accounting. So let me explain those terms to you because it may not be what you're thinking. Public accounting is when you work for, essentially, an accounting firm that is set up to provide accounting to many clients. Um, you don't you work for that one accounting firm, but that firm serves many companies, many individuals, um, versus private accounting when you work internally for one company. So you're doing accounting within a company or organization and you just work for that one company or organization. Um, so when we talk about public accounting, you can be doing count accounting for possibly even a publicly traded company or a privately held company or individuals, uh, small businesses. Um, but it doesn't have to do with being publicly or privately held. So I don't want to get those terms mixed up. So when we say public accounting, that means you work at, at a firm that provides accounting services to many. When we say private accounting, you can be working internally with a company that is a publicly traded corporation, but because you work internally for one company, it's considered private accounting. So in the realm of public accounting, and this is where most accountants start their career, not necessarily finish their career, this is where most start their career, is in the field of public accounting. And you work for an accounting firm that might be providing audit, tax, and consulting services. And within that field, really um, the designation that you strive to earn is what we call a CPA, Certified Public Accountant. So that's the most respected certification in the public accounting realm. Um, not to say that there aren't other valuable certifications, but that's the one that's recognized um, nationwide in terms of your legitimacy as an accountant. <clears throat> in the world of private accounting, um, there's something called the CMA, Certified Management Accountant, and sometimes the CIA, not what you're thinking, the Certified Internal Auditor designation. So these are exams that you can test for and become a CMA and or a CIA. And if you're working internally within large businesses, these are some valuable letters to have after your name. So what type of roles, uh, what type of job positions would fall into each of these? So in public accounting, you'd be working um, at an accounting firm providing audit, tax, consulting services. It could even be bookkeeping, payroll, um, you know, a long list of different types of services that you can provide working in the realm of public accounting. And again, if you don't have a CPA license, you can still provide tax and consulting services. You can still do bookkeeping and payroll. And that all falls on this side under public accounting. Um, and again, you can make anywhere from minimum wage up to, well, it's kind of unlimited. If you become a partner at a big accounting firm, you could make over seven figures a year. Yes, I said seven figures, over a million dollars a year. And working in the field of public accounting, um, in today's day and age, you could find yourself working from home. You could sit in your bunny slippers and pajamas, or you might find yourself wearing a suit and working downtown in a high rise. Um, so there's a lot of different possibilities depending on where you want to go with it and plenty of wiggle room in between. So it doesn't have to be minimum wage or a million dollars a year. Um, there's a lot of opportunity in the field of public accounting. When we talk about private accounting, again, a big range of different job titles you might find there. Um, you might start out working as um, an accounts payable clerk, an accounts receivable clerk. Um, you might um, move up and become an account analyst, an account manager. Um, other roles as you move up the ranks could be controller, um, accounting supervisor. You could be a CFO, so the um, chief financial officer for a corporation. So now we're moving way up the ranks in the world of private accounting. And again, the potential to earn anywhere from minimum wage to you know six-figure salaries um, in the world of private accounting. So these are positions that potentially have a lot of flexibility and um, upward mobility depending on where you start and what your education is. So um, I'm putting that out there again because when I was in college, I don't think anybody really ever sat me down and talked about what my different possibilities were in the world of accounting. Um, I just figured out halfway through college that I loved accounting and I wanted to do accounting and 
eventually, you know, graduated and ended up with a CPA license working at a big giant public accounting firm. And, you know, I never really thought through all of the many possibilities that were before me and all the flexibility that this particular um, major, this particular career path offered me in life. And now I'm really grateful for that and all the different work experiences I've had and also the flexibility it's provided me in my life, um, both in terms of how I spend my time and in terms of my fi finances, um, it's, it's done me well. So, um, you know, if you have more questions about careers in accounting, please don't be shy. Please feel free to talk to me during office hours. Um, I'd say stop by and visit me. Someday maybe we'll be back on campus and we can talk face to face. Um, but please feel free about chatting with me about different career paths there. So we're about to actually jump into accounting here. Um, before we do that, I'm gonna throw some letters at you. Um, first, we have the Financial Accounting Standards Board, which we call FASB. You're gonna find that accounting is riddled with acronyms. We, we like to use lots of letters and terminology, and sometimes it feels like we're speaking a foreign language. So if you're ever confused about some of those acronym, acronyms, don't, don't be afraid to slow me down and say, wait, what does that mean again? <laughs> so FASB, Financial Accounting Standards Board, um, is essentially the group that establishes the measurement and reporting rules that businesses use to facilitate communication. So essentially making sure that we're all playing by the same set of accounting rules. How do we know that I'm doing accounting the same as the next company, the same as the next company? We need to make sure we're comparing apples to apples. So that's the role of FASB. And those, those measurement rules that are established by FASB are what we refer to as GAAP, Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. And you're gonna hear a lot about GAAP this semester. Um, the good news for you, like I told you, I'm not big about memorizing things. Um, so I'm not going to make you memorize all of the different gaps. I'm not going to make you memorize each one of them. Um, instead, I'm just going to keep reiterating, kind of bonking you over the head with the few that are really relevant and important to what we're studying right now. And you'll get to hear some of those today already. Um, so we don't have to worry about memorizing it, but I'm hoping that there's a few that will just stick with you because we're going to talk about them a lot this semester. So as we get into these measurement rules, we need to understand when and how to measure an accounting transaction. And so part of that is understanding the cash basis versus accrual basis versus the, mm, I'm not sure what I'm doing basis. Um, sometimes we refer to that as a hybrid basis. I'll talk more about that. And how does that all fit into GAAP, Generally Accepted Accounting Principles? So what exactly do these mean? So cash basis is when we measure or record an accounting transaction when cash actually changes hands. So when we receive cash or we pay cash, that's when we record it. And that's different than accrual basis. Accrual basis isn't worried about when cash changes hands, but rather when it is earned or incurred. And let me explain that to you in the context of my favorite gap, my favorite generally accepted accounting principle is the matching concept. And the matching concept, you're going to hear me say it over and over, but if you want to get this down in your notes, I recommend it. The matching concept has three parts and here's what they are. First, we want to match our revenue to the period in which it was earned. We want to match our revenue to the period in which it was earned. Part two, we want to match our expenses to the period in which they are incurred. The word incurred, I-N-C-U-R-R-E-D, incurred. Um, that means that we've caused the expenses to happen, okay? Um, so if we have the lights on right now, we are causing utility expense. We are consuming electricity. So. Um, we, part two, we want to match our expenses to the period in which they're incurred. And then the third part, sometimes but not always applies, we want to match our expenses to the revenues they generate. We want to match our expenses to the revenues they generate. And you'll, I'll point out later in the semester when that part applies, 
Um, to start out, it'll just be the first two parts, and then we'll see other instances where the third part of the matching concept applies. But nowhere in there did you hear anything about cash changing hands. It was about when do we earn the revenue, when do we incur the expenses, and sometimes you want to match the expenses to the revenues in the period in which they're earned. Um, but nothing about the changing of cash, so we're not exchanging cash. Um, we could be, but that doesn't dictate when we record that accounting transaction. So let's contrast the cash basis and accrual basis. Let's say that you ask me to do your tax return and you give me all of your tax information and I go back to my office, I do your tax return and I deliver it back to you a week later and say, okay, I've done your tax return. You just need to sign here, sign there, and that'll be $5. Now that's a bargain discount tax return, isn't it? Please don't ever let anybody do your tax return for $5. It sounds kind of shady. Anyhow, I deliver the tax return to you and I say, that'll be $5. And you say, mm, I don't have my wallet today, so I can't pay you. Now that sounds a little bit suspect to me, but that's okay. Um, cash basis. What is my revenue? Did any cash change hands? So under the cash basis, I have zero revenue because you didn't pay me. What about under accrual basis? Part one of the matching concept says we want to match our revenues to the period in which they are earned. Did I do the work? Yep. Did I deliver the tax return to you? It's done and final? Yep. So did I earn the $5? Yes, I earned the $5. So under a cruel basis, my revenue is $5, even though you haven't paid me. What if you never pay me? Well, we'll deal with that in chapter seven. <laughs> so that is a very real question and a real problem. What if you never pay me? Um, that could be problematic, right? But the bottom line is that I earned the revenue by doing the work. So according to the accrual basis, I have $5 of revenue, where cash basis says I have zero. Now we could have an example just the same on the expense side. What if we get the electric bill and we take a look at it and we say, wow, I just don't want to pay that electric bill. I know I used up all the electricity. I had the lights on, the air conditioner on, and all my computers and my TV, but I just don't feel like paying it. It's expensive. Cash basis, we have zero expenses because we didn't pay the bill. Accrual basis though, what do you think? We have electricity expense or utilities expense because we caused that expense to be incurred. We used up those resources. We used the electricity and therefore we have to recognize the expense. Doesn't matter if we pay the bill or not. We'll deal with that trouble later. If we have bills we don't pay, yeah, there will be some trouble down the road. We'll deal with that later, but accrual basis says, yes, you have an expense because you incurred that expense. You caused that expense to happen. So that's your basic difference between cash and accrual basis. And if we're doing accounting according to generally accepted accounting principles, which includes my favorite, the matching concept, that means that we need to be doing accrual basis accounting. Cash basis doesn't really fit in there. And then, of course, we have the hybrid basis or the I'm not quite sure what I'm doing basis. And I want to bring this up and the same reason we talk about cash basis. A lot of us, including myself, will spend a large part of their career working for small businesses, owning and operating a small business or working for other small businesses. And a lot of small businesses do not have to strictly comply to GAAP. A lot of small business businesses do not have to strictly apply to GAAP. Well, then who does GAAP apply to? Well, GAAP definitely applies to large publicly traded corporations. So companies that sell their stock on the stock market, big companies that have outside investors to answer to, they have to follow the principles. They must. They're audited. We'll talk about audits later. Um, and they must follow GAAP. Um, lots of other companies also follow GAAP. A lot of medium 
uh, medium-sized companies, companies that do have outside investors or creditors that want gap financial statements. They want audited, reliable financial statements, and therefore they're going to follow gap. But then you get into the world of small business. And honestly, most businesses are small businesses um, just by the number of businesses that exist. Um, most businesses are in fact small businesses. And if they don't have outside investors and creditors that demand that they follow GAAP, then they don't have to follow GAAP. Is it a good idea to still comply with GAAP as best they can? Sure, absolutely but sometimes it's impractical for them. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. Sometimes they don't have the education and training to do it properly. So um, a very real possibility is that you're gonna run into businesses that run on the cash basis, and that doesn't mean that they're bad and wrong and evil. Um, it might just mean that you need to be aware of that as you read their financial statements and understand their financial statements. I gave you, you the example, what if we just don't wanna pay the electric bill? Well, according to cash basis, then it doesn't exist and it's not going to show up as an expense. Does that seem kind of scary to you if you're reading the financial statements of a business that just chooses not to pay some of its bills? Yeah, that could potentially be problematic. So we just need to be aware of it and the owners need to be aware of it. Um, a lot of small businesses try to implement some amount of accrual basis. They do certain things on accrual basis and they do other things on cash basis because it's just simply too hard, too confusing, or maybe just sometimes unnecessary. And so they'll operate on a hybrid basis is the nice way of explaining it. And again, that doesn't make them bad and wrong and evil. It's just something that you have to be aware of if you're reading those financial statements and using them to make decisions. This semester, we're focusing on corporate accounting that complies with GAAP, and this can be used by companies large and small, and therefore, we're going to be using accrual basis. GAAP doesn't directly say, thou shalt use accrual basis, but it does give us the matching concept, and those three parts of the matching concept point to accrual basis. One, we need to match our revenue to the period in which it's earned. Two, we need to match our expenses to the period in which they're incurred. And three, sometimes but not always, we need to match our expenses to the revenues they generate. And the combination of those three things points us directly to using accrual basis accounting. So now that we know that we're going to be focusing in on accrual basis, we need to understand who needs to do accounting and whose accounting are we talking about. And we refer to that as reporting entities. And here the text tells us financial accounting reports disclose the financial activities of particular individuals or organizations described as reporting entities. So an individual person can have accounting and financial statements, and then separately, an organization needs to have accounting and financial statements. Um, the point that they're making here, though, is that we want to keep it separate. Each entity is treated as a separate reporting unit. For example, a business, the person who owns that business, and the bank that loans money to the business are treated as three separate reporting entities. Now, I'm pretty sure that you knew that the business and the bank that loans money to that business are separate reporting entities, but a lot of times I see confusion among especially small business owners that muddle their finances and accounting between their business and um, their selves individually and they co-mingle their business and personal funds, they mix their business and personal accounting together. And I will tell you that is a big no-no. If you're going to start a business, whether it's large or small, you need to run that business neat and clean and keep your personal finances out of it. The business doesn't pay your personal bills and you individually don't pay the business's bills. And business income goes into the business and the other income that doesn't have to do with the business is yours personally. So we don't want to muddle those finances. We don't want to commingle business and personal accounting and finances. So those are separate entities, separate reporting units, and we want to keep that nice and clean. And I'm emphasizing that because I see a lot of small businesses. I work with a lot of small businesses. I'm kind of a small business specialist and I see too many new business owners make that mistake. And then they get in these bad habits that are hard to break and they co-mingle their business and personal money. And it gets messy 
and it's potentially problematic and could lead to an audit down the road and that would be a bad thing. So I encourage you as you guys become business owners, entrepreneurs, managers, and businesses, make sure that business and personal are two separate things. So next, we're getting close to the accounting equation, and I'll tell you the accounting equation is the most important equation that you will ever learn. You can go ahead and tell your math teacher that, haha. -ha. Um, we're gonna learn it here in a few minutes, but first we need to understand some terminology and what we refer to as the elements of the financial statements. So I'm gonna run through some of these terms and I've told you before, I'm not huge on definitions. I like to explain things in simple, understandable terms and I don't necessarily need you to memorize them. I just want you to understand them. So first we have assets. Did you guys read the chapter? Do you know what assets are? Assets, in my simple terminology, that's your stuff. <laughs> yep, there's your definition. Assets is your stuff. Um, in a business context, our assets would include our money, our building, our vehicles, our computers, equipment, trucks. Um, there's lots of other assets that we're going to learn as we go along, but those are some examples of assets. Um, it could be land. It could be inventory, which is a term we'll learn about in a couple chapters. But it's our stuff. It's all the stuff that our business owns. What, doesn't matter how we got the money, doesn't matter if we borrowed money or the money came from the investors, but it's all of the stuff that belongs to our business. Next we have liabilities. Liabilities is what we owe, money that we owe to creditors. Let's say we borrowed money to the, from a bank, so that becomes a liability that we're expected to pay it back later. The third one here, equity. Um, we're going to end up spending a lot of time on equity. Right now I'm going to try to give you a simple definition, but um, I think it's really honestly pretty fuzzy. I think this is one of the most difficult terms here. Um, equity rep represents the owner's stake in the business. The owner's stake in the business. But that's kind of confusing. It's kind of, it, it's math, it's, it's numbers, um, but it's not really something that you can take a picture of or put in a box. Um, so it's kind of confusing. So we're going to spend a good deal of time talking about what is equity, what goes into equity, and breaking it down into its components. Rather than worrying about a precise definition, we just really need to understand what goes into it. One of the things that goes into it is, number four, contributed capital. And that is the money that the investors put into the business to get their ownership in the business. So contributed capital, this text primarily refers to that as common stock. So contributed capital and common stock seem to be used interchangeably in this text. And again, that is the money that the investors put into the business in order to buy their ownership in the company. And that is part of the equity. Going back to the term equity, I said it's the owner's stake in the business. So the money they initially put in is part of that stake in the business, part of their equity. Let's come down, I'm going to look at five, six, and eight. That makes more sense to me. Revenue, expense, and net income. Revenue is what we earn. Okay, so if we're in business, what we earn doing what we're in business to do. Expenses are the costs that we incur in order to earn that revenue. So expenses could include things like rent, insurance, utilities, salaries, I mean, the list of different expenses could go on and on. Um, so that's expenses. We'll be encountering a lot of different expenses throughout the semester. And then let me skip down to number eight, net income. Um, this is just math. Revenue minus expense equals net income. It's what's left over after we cover our expenses. So revenue minus expense equals net income. Hopefully it's a positive number. If it's a negative number, sometimes we refer to it as a net loss, and that would imply that our expenses are greater than our revenue. So obviously we'd prefer to have positive net income, meaning our revenue is greater than our expenses. So let me go back and look at number seven. Number seven is distributions, and that's money that is paid to the investors. Um, it's not a refund of their contributed capital, 
Okay, not a refund of their contributed capital, but rather money that is given to the investors in the business essentially as a thank you. Thank you for investing in us. We've been successful and here is a distribution for you. In a corporate setting, we refer to that as a dividend. So you'll see the term dividends throughout the semester because we're studying corporate accounting, but distribution is the broader term that we might use in a non-corporate setting. All of the accounting that we're learning this semester, um, it can be applied to corporations and other forms of business like sole proprietorships, uh, partnerships, LLCs, etc. Um, it's just a matter of a couple differences. Contributed capital, we're going to call common stock. Distributions in corporations are referred to as dividends. So um, what you're learning here will apply regardless of whether you're doing accounting for a corporation or not. Um, just a few different, different little nuances. Um, the last two items on the list, gains and losses, I don't want to dive too much into right now. I think you've got enough on your brain already today. We're going to visit these in later chapters, but just to give you a, a little tiny taste of what we're referring to here, gains and losses um, are generated from doing something that we are not in business to do. So let's say I run my accounting firm and I decide I want to buy a new computer, but before I buy a new computer, I'm going to sell my old computer. And I sell that computer to somebody who needs an extra computer. And when I sell it, it's going to generate a gain or loss. Probably if I'm selling a used computer, it's probably going to be a loss. But that's okay. We'll learn how to do the math on that later. But the point is, I'm not in the business of selling computers. I've sold off one of my assets and doing so mathematically will result in a gain or a loss, okay? So that's kind of the context there, but we'll study gains and losses and how to compute them in a later chapter. So don't worry about that for the moment. So again, these are what we call the elements of the financial statements. And then what you're gonna find out is within each of these elements, we're gonna have separate accounts underneath them. So when we talk about assets, we'll see that we have things like cash, land, trucks, each of those will be a separate account under assets. When it comes to liabilities, we might have notes payable, accounts payable, interest payable, different types of money that we owe to others. And so again, liabilities is the broad element and then separately there'll be different accounts under that. So I'll point that out to you when we get there. Um, but we'll have unique accounts for each different type of asset, each different liability, each different expense, etc. So now we're finally ready for the accounting equation. The accounting equation is assets equal claims in its most simple form. We're gonna, we're gonna build that up a little bit. Claims, that wasn't one of our terms, was it? Well, let's define claims. Claims are, we have claims on our assets from two sources creditors and investors. Remember, those are our two sources of financial resources. And those claims on the assets, if they belong to creditors, they're what we call liabilities, what we owe. Or if it's from investors, it's equity, the owner's stake in the business. So if we use the substitution property, get rid of the word claims and substitute it with liabilities plus equity, then we actually get the accounting equation as we know it here. Assets equal liabilities plus equity or owner's equity. So I think allo. I know, really cheesy, but it's true. It works. You'll see it a lot. So I've got my little hokey allo plant here. And as long as you remember allo, assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity. And that could be stockholders equity, shareholders equity, just equity. It doesn't matter. As long as we get the equal sign in the right place, we now know the accounting equation. We're going to be using the accounting equation incessantly throughout the semester. The accounting equation must be equal, meaning it must balance at all times, transaction by transaction and in whole. And so we're going to be using it constantly, checking it constantly to make sure that we're doing our work right. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that I want you to learn to read the accounting equation, not just as an equation that has to be equal and balanced, but rather an explanation. And let me explain what I mean by that. 
So if I have my accounting equation here, I have $500 of assets equals $200 of liabilities plus $300 of equity. I think we can agree that 500 equals 200 plus 300. So we're in balance, so it equates. But I want you to read it as an explanation. How did I get $500 of assets? Oh, that's right, I borrowed $200 from creditors and the other 300 was invested by the owners, the stockholders. So the right side of the equation explains how we got the assets that are on the left side of the equation. And the other thing to realize is mathematically, if we need to rearrange the accounting equation or if we're missing a component of the accounting equation, we can use it to figure out. So if I know I have $500 in my business and I know I borrowed $200 from a friend, then how much equity do we have? Well, mathematically, it has to be $300. So I would know mathematically that our equity must be the rest, the other component. So we can use the accounting equation to back into a missing component, but again, I want you to really focus in on using the accounting equation as an explanation. The right side of the equation explains how we got the assets on the left. So here in review, we've got the accounting equation, assets is our stuff, equals the sum of liabilities, meaning the creditor stake in the business, plus equity, the owner stake in the business. Now, I think for most of you, assets and liabilities are probably a pretty clear concept. We know what assets are, that's the stuff we have um, in a business, that's our cash, land, buildings, computers, equipment, um, the list goes on and on. Liabilities, that's what we owe. We borrow money from a lender like a bank and we owe that money to them, that's a liability. But then we get to equity. And again, earlier I gave you a definition, it's the owner's stake in the business. But I think that concept is still probably fuzzy for many of you. What does that even mean? So you put money in and essentially when we talk about equity, it's a mathematical computation of what you put in plus what you've earned, less what you've paid out. So um, rather than get more in detail with a definition, I'd rather just focus on breaking equity down into its parts. So equity is the sum of common stock, remember that's another term for contributed capital, plus retained earnings. And that's a phrase you're gonna start hearing a lot, retained earnings. Um, and again, we can say, well, what is retained earnings? Mm, well, let me give you my classic definition. It's earnings that you retain. Mm, was that helpful? I'm not so sure. Retained earnings are the earnings that you retain, but it's actually true. Um, later, we're gonna break down retained earnings further and you're gonna see exactly what I mean. So just hold on to that thought. If equity and this whole concept of common stock and retained earnings and equity, if all of that's still a little bit fuzzy for you, don't worry, just hang in there. We're gonna break it down for you and we're gonna keep going back to this concept. <clears throat> so next, we're gonna look at our four financial statements. There will be four financial statements that you're expected to learn this semester. These are the four, so I'm not gonna be throwing in any other new financial statements at you later on. It's just these four. So let me walk you through each of them. First, we have the income statement. Um, sometimes it's called the profit and loss, results of operations, or statement of earnings. Income statement is probably the most common and universal name, but please do forgive me if sometimes I say profit and loss because this the accounting software that I use most frequently refers to it as a profit and loss. But no matter what we call it, it still does the same thing. We're taking revenue minus expense equals net income. What's the purpose of this financial statement? Well, it's gonna tell us, did we make any money? Were we profitable during this period? It tells us how much money uh, we made, or it could be a loss, right? So if our expenses are greater than our revenue, we could end up with a net loss. But um, the income statement is always going to show revenue minus expense and result in a figure at the bottom that's our net income, whether it's positive or negative. If it's negative, we could call it a net loss. But it's for a certain period of time. And the header of the financial statement is going to define that. 
It'll show the company's name, the name of the financial statement, in this case, the income statement, and then it's gonna show the period of time. So whether it's for the month of August, for the second quarter of 2020, for the year of 2019, but it's for a defined period of time with a starting point and an ending point. Um, I'm highlighting that because most of our financial statements are for a period of time, but there's one of them that's only for one point in time. The next statement is the statement of changes in equity. Sometimes we'll call that statement of capital, statement of changes in stockholders' equity, statement of stockholders' equity, um, kind of a variety of different combinations using these words. Um, so you might see slightly different names for that. I'll try to be consistent in calling it the statement of stockholders' equity or the statement of changes in stockholders' equity. Um, but I know a lot of students say, uh, I don't know, the, the one with the long name, the second one. That's okay. I know what you mean. Um, the purpose of this statement is to really examine equity and look at how ownership and equity have changed over a particular period of time. Now, of course, that particular period of time is the same as the corresponding income statement. So again, it would be for the month of August, meaning from August 1st to August 31st, or for the second quarter from April 1st to June 30th, or for the full year of 2019 from January 1st to December 31st. So again, a, a period of time with a starting and ending point. Our next financial statement is the balance sheet. Um, the balance sheet, sometimes called Statement of Financial Position, is literally ALO. It shows that the accounting equation balances. It shows that assets balance with liabilities plus stockholders' equity. So from that statement, we can find out what do I have, meaning what assets do I have? What do I owe, meaning what are my liabilities? And then we've got the equity section of the balance sheet, which will reiterate some of what we do on the statement of changes in stockholders' equity. But it's this particular financial statement, and only this one, it indicates our balances at one point in time. It's a snapshot of what we have at one point in time. So if I told you that I need you to, need you to prepare the financial statements for the month of August, your income statement and your statement of changes in equity would cover the period from August 1st to August 31st. But the balance sheet would be what you have and what you owe at the close of business on August 31st. If I asked you to prepare a balance sheet for a span of time, a period of time, you wouldn't be able to do that. Your balance sheet only gets to have one balance in terms of your cash, your land, your equipment, all of your assets. Those things might fluctuate during a period. So your balance sheet is always prepared at the end point of the corresponding financial statement period. So if I ask you to do your 2019 financial statements, your income statement, statement of changes in equity, and even the statement of cash flows, which we'll talk about next, those would all cover from January 1st to December 31st, 2019. But your balance sheet would be what you have and what you owe as of the close of business on December 31st, 2019. So it's the end point. Finally, that brings us to the statement of cash flows, which really doesn't have any other names. The statement of cash flows and the statement of cash flows, it's pretty much always called just that. This is a really critical financial statement, especially when we're talking about accrual basis accounting. Now remember, cash basis accounting um, was interested in when cash changes hands and we would record revenue or record expenses when cash changes hands. But accrual basis accounting says, nah, we don't really care about that. We're more interested in when you earn the revenue and when you incur the expenses. So the statement of cash flows becomes critically important in understanding how our cash is obtained and used, understanding money in and money out, because you can earn revenue but not have any money. See, remember the $5 you owe me from the tax return? I can't run my business if nobody pays me. So I could have revenue and I could appear profitable, but if I don't have money in the bank, then I can't continue to run my business. So the purpose is to explain how cash is obtained and used in your business. It answers my favorite question that I get from clients all the time. Where did my money go? Well, the statement of cash flows can help explain that. It'll show you what you used your cash on. 
And then finally, I love this question. My business is profitable, meaning I have positive net income on my income statement. So why don't I have enough money to pay my bills? Well, it goes right back to the $5 you owe me from the tax return. If you would have paid me, I would have cash in the bank and I could pay my bills. So I can show positive net income on my income statement because it's a cruel basis, but that does not guarantee that we have cash in the bank. It's totally possible for a business to be profitable but have cash flow problems. How about the other way around? Could we have tons of cash in the bank and be running a big net loss on our income statement? Is that possible? Yeah, it absolutely is. What if our business is doing very poorly, but we keep borrowing money and enticing investors to put more money into the business? So we could have a big lump of cash in the bank and actually be doing very poorly in terms of running a net loss year after year. So the statement of cash flows helps fill in that gap to connect accrual basis accounting to understanding of cash in and cash out in our business. Super important. Um, I think a lot of students, by the time they get to doing the statement of cash flows, by the time they walk through all four financial statements, sometimes the statement of cash flows gets neglected a little bit. And I want to caution you strongly about that. The statement of cash flows is very important to be able to prepare and be able to read and understand. And I think by the end of the semester, I think at the end of the semester, you will know more about how to prepare, read, and understand a statement of cash flows than many CEOs that I know. Now, that speaks quite poorly of the CEOs I know, and that means that also that I think pretty highly of you. The reality is people don't spend enough time understanding this financial statement, but I'm willing to invest that time with you to help you understand it. So please don't disregard this statement. Please give it equal study as you go through your four financial statements. So I want to come back to this accounting equation. And we were talking about the owner's equity part being made up of common stock and retained earnings. And I want to get a little bit more into that. So we understand the basic accounting equation. And this is what I write out. I call it the aloe tree. So we've got our basic accounting equation across the top. Assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity. And then beneath that, I'm breaking down owner's equity Rather than trying to define it, I just break it into its components. It's our common stock plus our retained earnings. And I promised you we were going to revisit this concept of retained earnings. I said it's earnings that we retain. Well, that seems pretty simple, but what does that really mean? Well, retained earnings has two components. Retained earnings is made up of net income. Now we've heard that term before, right? Net income is revenue minus expense equals net income. And essentially, I did this after our financial statements because this, this little blue circle here, I labeled it IS, that's our income statement. So the income statement, our net income from the income statement feeds into our retained earnings. But what takes away from retained earnings is when we decide not to retain all of it we decide to pay out some of our retained earnings in the form of dividends. And that's a perfectly okay thing for a company to do. If they were making money and they have enough cash available, they might choose to pay out a dividend to their stockholders. And so those would be earnings that we choose not to retain. So when we look at this, when we think about what is retained earnings, it's the net income in our business that we end up retaining. So it's our net income less any dividends paid out. I'm gonna go a little bit more in depth here. If we look at, I, I put little pluses and minuses down here, and I want you to think about what those mean. If our business is earning more and more revenue, we're making more sales or we're selling more of whatever it is we sell, that's gonna cause our net income to go up and therefore our retained earnings to go up, and I could even say our owner's equity to go up. So that's why I put a plus there. Revenue has a positive relationship to net income, retained earnings, and owner's equity. What about expenses though? As we incur more and more expenses, our expenses are going up, our bills are through the roof. What does that do to our net income? It's gonna make net income go down, 
and then retained earnings go down and owner's equity go down. So expenses have a negative relationship to net income, retained earnings, and owner's equity. They take away from it. And dividends. Now dividends, I want you to notice, is not part of the income statement. It does not factor into our net income. You want to know why? I'm going to put it to you very basically. Dividends are not an expense. Yep, that's it. That's, that's all it is. <laughs> that's not a very good reason, but it's truth. Dividends are not an expense. If they were an expense, they would be over here, but they're not. There's something separate. So I want you to have that mantra in your head. Dividends are not an expense. Dividends are not an expense. Dividends are not an expense. They do not belong on the income statement. They do not affect our net income. They're separate over here. So when we pay out our dividends, we are not retaining those earnings. We're giving them out to the shareholders. So these are unretained earnings. So they take away from our retained earnings. So dividends, paying out dividends is gonna cause retained earnings to go down and owner's equity to go down overall. So really, the only possible way to cause our retained earnings to go up is to earn revenue. Do what we're in business to do. Sell more goods, provide more services. So the only one with a positive relationship to retained earnings is revenue. That's the only way to generate positive retained earnings. And businesses need to focus on that. So if we were in the classroom together, you'd see me write out allo in my accounting tree all the time. And I wanna just go over it with you right now. So let's write it out. And I do use colors for a reason. So we've got assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. And that's our balance sheet, right? So I'm gonna underline all of that in red. That's our balance sheet. And just so you know, balance sheet in accounting, we sometimes abbreviate BS, and it means nothing other than balance sheet. Then let's move on. So if we break down our owner's equity, then we've got common stock and retained earnings. So common stock is the contributed capital. It's what the investors or the shareholders put in. And then we break down our retained earnings further into dividends and net income. I know a little sloppy. I'm drawing with my finger on a computer screen, so forgive me. So we've got retained earnings is made up of dividends and net income. And of course we know that net income is revenue minus expense. All right, and then I'm gonna to switch to blue. This is our income statement, right? So I'm gonna put IS. So revenue minus expense equals net income. That's our income statement. And then I do wanna mark which ones have positive and negative relationships to retained earnings. So if we pay out dividends, is that making retained earnings go up or down? I hope you said down. So when we pay out dividends, we're unretaining the retained earnings. Yes, I'm making up words. Don't worry about it. You know what I meant. Unretained is not a word, but we're paying out our earnings. Rather than keeping them, we're paying them back to the stockholders. How about when we earn revenue? Does that make net income and retained earnings go up or down? When we earn revenue, that makes net income go up and therefore retained earnings goes up. And what about expenses? As we incur more and more expenses, that's gonna pull our net income and therefore our retained earnings down. So there's a minus that takes away from our retained earnings. Hopefully that all makes sense to you. We're gonna keep repeating this and even building on this. So I'm gonna leave this here right now and we're gonna revisit it later on. Um, 
but that's your basic accounting equation with my expanded accounting tree or my allo tree because we really need to understand this mystical owner's equity thing. So this part down here is gonna be critical for us. We'll come back to it later. So the next thing we need to conquer is how to put accounting transactions into the accounting equation. So we're gonna learn how to analyze transactions and record them essentially. As we do that, we're going to be classifying those accounting transactions as asset source, asset use, or asset exchange transactions. And again, I'm not big on memorization. I'm gonna point these out as we go, and I think understanding what that means and being able to recognize asset source, asset use, and asset exchange transactions will be useful to you. But it's not something I need you to, to memorize, just something I need you to gain an understanding of, and it's gonna help with your accounting comprehension. Oh, and one more thing. Remember a bunch of slides back, probably almost an hour ago now, I kind of told you a little lie, and I knew it was a lie when I said it, that remember I told you there's two sources of financial resources, investors or owners, and creditors. So I told you there's two sources, investors and creditors. There's really a third one, and it's the best one. The third one is earnings from profitable operations. That's a fantastic source of financial resources that we're a successful company, we're making money, and that is our source of financial resources. We don't need to seek money from outside investors and creditors. We're making enough money on our own. So that is our third source, and that'll come into play in just a moment here. So my apologies for the my, my apologies for the minor fib that there's only two. There's actually three two from the outside investors and creditors and one from the inside earnings from profitable operations. So we're going to dive in and do transactions for this company called Rustic Campsites. Okay, we're going to walk through this together and learn how to record accounting transactions under the accounting equation. So first what I want you to see is here they have laid out Assets equal liabilities plus stockholders equity. So that is familiar, that is our accounting equation. And then beneath these elements, we have specific account titles, cash and land. Um, under liabilities, they have NPAY, which stands for notes payable. Under stockholders equity, we have of course, KUSK and RET EAR. Mm, I think that's common stock and retained earnings. Sometimes it gets a little irritating in accounting. We use a lot of acronyms, but also a lot of abbreviations too. So if you're not clear on something, of course, feel free to ask. That's common stock and retained earnings. So let's read this transaction. Rustic Campsites, or RCS, was formed on January 1st, year one, when it acquired $120,000 cash from issuing stock. So first of all, let me be really clear. Um, we don't just magically acquire $120,000. It doesn't just fall out of the sky and land in our bank account. What really went on here? Somebody or a group of people decided to form a corporation. They decided to form a new business entity. They did all the paperwork. They paid all the fees. They jumped through all the hoops. Finally, their corporation has been formed. They open a bank account, and now it's time to put money in the bank account. So where does that money come from? It comes from the owners or the investors in the business. So they collectively, or if it's one person, they decided to put their money into this business, to invest in this small business. So this $120,000 doesn't just magically drop into their bank account. This is somebody's hard earned money, somebody's life savings, or maybe it's a bunch of people. Maybe it's 12 people that put $10,000 each. So still, it's a significant sum of money that people pulled out of their own bank accounts and decided to invest in rustic campsites. It doesn't just magically appear. So somebody went to the trouble to form a corporation, and now they've decided that they want to fund that corporation by investing in it. So they're stockholders, and they've put in $120,000 cash. So as we record this, we're going to be using what's called double entry bookkeeping. 
Wait a minute, I thought this was accounting class, not bookkeeping. Well, here's the truth. Bookkeeping is a huge part of accounting. You have to be good at bookkeeping in order to do accounting. Now, some of you may have already taken a course in bookkeeping, and that's awesome. You're going to be off to a great start in this course. But I'm teaching this course as if you have never taken any bookkeeping before. So don't worry. We're not going to leave you behind. I'm going to teach you all the bookkeeping you need to know as well. So we're using what's called double entry bookkeeping. And what that means is that every transaction is going to affect the accounting equation in two places, at least two places. And if you think about it, since it's, it's an equation, what you do to one side, you also have to do to the other side. In order for the equation to balance, of course we have to impact it in two places. So let's think about rustic campsites. They received $120,000 cash from issuing common stock. So what two accounts are affected? Cash and common stock. And they're both gonna go up, so we're gonna record $120,000 in the cash column and $120,000 under common stock. And of course, 120 equals 120, we're in balance, and that should be it, right? Hmm, one more thing. I do want to note that this is an asset source transaction. And you'll recognize that because both sides of the accounting equation are going up. When both sides increase, it's an asset source. And we should be able to ask them, well, what is the source? There's only three possibilities, investors, creditors, or earnings from profitable operations. What do you think? We got it from issuing common stock. Who do we issue stock to? The investors. So when we issue common stock, it's an asset source transaction and the source is investors. You ready to try another one? All right, event number two. RCS acquired an additional $400,000 of cash by borrowing from a creditor. So again, we're gonna use double entry bookkeeping. So this has to affect the accounting equation in two places. So what two accounts do you think? We acquired cash by borrowing from a creditor. So I'm hoping you said cash. We're gonna put $400,000 in the cash column. It's increasing. And we're gonna put $400,000 under liabilities, specifically notes payable. And I want to point out, this is positive 400000 A lot of times I get students that feel negatively about borrowing money. They feel negatively about owing money to somebody. But in terms of accounting, you owe them positive $400,000. If you put negative $400,000 there, would we be in balance? We would then have 400000 equals negative 400000 mm, That's not true, is it? So it has to be positive, 400,000 equals 400,000. So this again is an asset source transaction. We see both sides of the accounting equation going up. They're both increasing. And again, what's the source? Investors, creditors, or earnings from profitable operations? What do you think? We borrowed from a creditor. I'm hoping you said creditor. And we, need, we need to realize that we have to balance transaction by transaction, but also in sum. So I can say I have $520,000 of cash, so 520 equals 400,000 plus 120,000. So we're in balance in sum as well. So transaction by transaction and in total, we must balance. And again, I wanna go back to that statement. We want to make sure we can read the accounting equation as an explanation as well. If I said, hey, how did we get $520,000? That's pretty nice. We have a good chunk of cash there. Where did it come from? Well, the accounting equation explains it. <clears throat> $400,000 came from borrowing money from a creditor, and $120,000 was invested by stockholders. So that explains how we got our assets. Remember, the right side of the equation explains how we got the stuff on the left. Let's keep going. Event three, RCS paid $500,000 cash to purchase land. 
So now we're going to use up a bunch of that cash and buy a different asset, land. <clears throat> so we're swapping one asset for another asset. So that's what we call an asset exchange transaction. So cash is going to go down and land is going to go up. And that's just what we see here. Under the cash column, we record negative 500,000. <clears> and under the land column, we show positive 500,000. In accounting, we most commonly use parentheses to indicate negative. So if you're writing this out on paper, you would probably want to use parentheses, not just a minus sign. So we've got negative 500 plus positive 500 equals N-A-N-A-N-A. -N -A -N -A. Well, is that true? Do we balance? So we have zero on the left and N-A on the right. Yep, that balances. And again, if we add up our accounting equation, We've got $20,000 remaining in cash. <clears throat> we have now $500,000 in land. So that's $520,000. How did we get all these assets? We borrowed $400,000 from the bank and $120,000 was invested by the stockholders. All right, event four. RCS obtained $85,000 cash by leasing campsites to customers. I want to reword that. I really don't like the word obtained. You could obtain $85,000 by robbing a bank. Not a good idea. Let's strike that and say earned. RCS earned $85,000 cash by leasing campsites to customers. What do we call that when we earn money from doing what we're in business to do? That's revenue. We've earned the $85,000. We did what we're in business to do. We leased out campsites. That's a lot of expensive campsites, I guess. But anyhow, that's what the transaction says. So what two accounts do you think are going to be impacted? Well, let's read the words. Cash. And then we got to figure out this one. We earned money. Again, that's going to be revenue. But where do we put that in our accounting equation? So let's start by recording $85,000 cash. So cash is going up. And then where does revenue go? Well, if we go back to our accounting equation, the one with the, the aloe tree under it, if we go all the way back to that, we'll find our revenue. There we go, our accounting equation. We find revenue way down here, right? So a revenue is gonna increase net income, which is gonna increase our retained earnings. So we're gonna end up recording revenue, expense, and even dividends all under the retained earnings column in this format. And that's perfectly okay, but I challenge you, anytime you put something under the retained earnings column, make sure you know why. Ask yourself, is it revenue, expense, or dividends? And sometimes either on a worksheet or in your homework, you'll be asked to define that. Why did you put this in retained earnings? And there might be an extra space there for you to note revenue, expense, or dividends. So back here on event four, that's why the $85,000 is under retained earnings. It's revenue. So most of the time when you see positive numbers there, you're pretty confident that it's revenue. So cash goes up and revenue goes up, which is gonna make our retained earnings go up. And we still balance in sum as well. Now we have $105,000 of cash and $500,000 of land. That adds up to 605. <clears throat> How did we get all those assets? 400,000 came from creditors, 120,000 came from investors, and $85,000 came from earnings from profitable operations, earnings that we retained, retained earnings, of course. Let's keep going. RCS paid $50,000 cash for operating expenses, such as salaries, rent, and interest. So this is our first time having expenses, right? So let's see how this works. So we're paying out cash, so we've got negative 50,000 under the cash column. Cash is going down. And we put the expenses also under retained earnings for the same reason that revenue went under retained earnings. Remember, remember revenue, expense, and dividends are all gonna go under retained earnings. 
This is what we call an asset use transaction. Both sides of the accounting equation are going down. So we're using up some of our cash to pay out our expenses, causing both sides to go down. And in total, we still balance. We have 555,000 on the asset side equals 400 plus 120 plus 35,000. So our retained earnings go down when we pay out expenses. And again, anytime you put something under retained earnings, you should be prepared to note why, what is that? And in this case, we would wanna note its expenses. Next, RCS paid $4,000 in cash dividends to its owners. Now this is gonna be handled similarly to expenses. Remember, revenue, expense, and dividends are all gonna get recorded under the retained earnings column. So cash is going down by $4,000, and retained earnings is going down by $4,000. We did not retain those earnings, we chose to pay them back to our investors. So retained earnings is going down, and again, an asset use transaction, both sides of the accounting equation are going down. And we're still in balance. In total, we have $551,000 in assets equals 400 plus 120 plus 31. Yep, that all mathematically checks out. So that brings us to event seven. This one I want to spend a few minutes on. It's kind of a tricky one. So the land that RCS paid $500,000 to purchase had an appraised market value of $525,000 at December 31st, so at year end. So we bought the land for $500,000 and according to an appraisal, it's now $525,000. So my question is, who cares? Does that matter? So let's find out. Historical cost concept and reliability concept are both gaps. Both are generally accepted accounting principles. The historical cost concept requires that most assets, not all, but all of the ones that you know of right now, so I'll let you know when there's one that doesn't fall in this category. So it requires that most assets be reported at the amount that we paid for them. So their historical cost, what we paid regardless of increases in market value. So we ignore changes in market value is essentially what that says. We record our assets at what we paid for them. Accountants use historical cost concept in this case since it will not vary from the amount shown on, shown or recorded in the records. So accountants are always gonna use the historical cost concept when it comes to their long-term assets like land. The reality is that all assets change in market value constantly. Everything changes in market value constantly. Um, I know that seems like a big statement, but it's true. Um, all assets change in market value constantly. That includes cash. Cash changes in terms of its value over time and also its value US dollars relative to other foreign currencies. Uh, that includes our land, our equipment, buildings, cars, computers. All of it changes in market value constantly. To try to keep up with it and have appraisals and guesses at what our current market value is, um, isn't really how we want to spend our time in accounting. So we focus in on historical cost and we record things at what we paid. So that's nice that it appraises at 525, but we're not going to do anything because it's gonna stay at 500,000 on our books. Another gap that supports this is the reliability concept. We only consider information to be reliable if it can be independently verified. Appraised values are just opinions and might vary from one appraiser to the next. So for some that might be a tough concept. I taught this exact concept one time with the owner of a local appraisal company sitting in the front row of my class and he still had his name badge on from going out on an appraisal right before he came to class. And he says, what do you mean? It's just an opinion. 
I'm educated. I worked hard for this position. Said, no, 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 that's fine. We need appraisals. They pay, play an important role in the world of financing and lending. It's very important. But in accounting, we don't really use them. There's definitely importance. I know there's training and skill and all kinds of work that goes into properly doing an appraisal, but it still is an educated opinion. So in accounting, we're not going to use that. We're going to stick with historical cost and record things at what we originally paid for them, regardless of changes in market value. So while accountants rely heavily on this concept, information must be independently verifiable in order to be considered reliable. And unfortunately, appraised values are opinions. So again, we're just going to leave this alone. And so what I want you to understand here is that it doesn't matter if something is appraised at a higher or lower market value. And your textbook is going to give you problems. You're going to see problems in the homework where they try to trick you into recording something on the last transaction. They'll tell you that the building went up or down in value. And I want you to know it's perfectly okay to have no entry and be confident and know why that why you're not making an entry. And you could say, I'm not making an entry because of historical cost concept and reliability concept. So what if RCS land had been appraised at 1.5 million? I mean, surely we have to record that, right? Because now it's tripled in value. Hmm. No, still historical cost concept and reliability concepts still apply. So we still do nothing. Hey, but here's your business lesson for the day. If the RCS land appraises at 1.5 million, what should you do? I hope you said sell it. If your land for this campsite business triples in value, it went from 500,000 to 1.5 million within a year, sell the land and walk away. You're welcome. There is your business lesson of the day. Um, what I'm referring to is these appraised values, they're only real if you make them real. And that means selling, realizing a transaction, actually selling the property and getting the $1.5 million in cash and walking away from RCS. That would make the transaction real. So again, here's my little reminder danger, danger, they're going to try to trick you and some of your homework problems into recording something when land or buildings or equipment changes in market value. And I want you to know that you can be confident in saying no entry. I don't need to record anything. We leave it alone at, at its historical cost, what we paid for it. So in summary, here's all seven transactions. And notice number seven, we just have NA all the way across. But we've got the other six transactions recorded up above. And then we sum at the bottom. So we record all seven transactions. We sum it once across the bottom. These numbers in red across the bottom, those aren't in red just for fun. That's our balance sheet. So on our balance sheet, we're going to show 51,000 plus 500,000. So we've got 551,000 in assets equals our liabilities plus stockholders equity. 400,000 plus 120 plus 31,000 also adds up to 551,000. So the numbers in red across the bottom of this summary, that is our balance sheet. Over here in the retained earnings column, we're going to find data that we need for our income statement, specifically revenue minus expense, but not the dividends, right? Notice we leave those out. Revenue minus expense equals net income. We don't include the dividends. Why? Dividends are not an expense. So we'll deal with those separately. Let's keep co going. We'll come back to this in a moment when we prepare our financial statements together. So as we went through these transactions, um, I hope you paid a little bit of a, a little attention to asset source, asset exchange, and asset use transactions. Asset source transactions are when both sides of the accounting equation go up. And you should be able to identify the source, investors, creditors, or earnings from profitable operations. 
An asset exchange is when we swap one asset for another. So numbers are pushing around on the left side of the equation. Nothing's happening on the right side of the equation. So an example would be using cash to buy land. And then finally, an asset use transaction is when both sides of the equation are going down. Um, so both sides are decreasing. An example of that might be using cash to pay expenses or using cash to pay out dividends or using cash to pay off debt liabilities. So again, I don't need you to memorize that. I just want you to see it and acknowledge it as you read through some of your homework exercises and problems. See if you can identify those things and it's going to help you in your accounting comprehension. So our next task is going to be to prepare our four financial statements. And everything we need is really in that summary. Remember we looked at our summary just a moment ago. And again, the red numbers across the bottom represent the balance sheet. The numbers in blue over here, revenue and expense, are gonna go onto our income statement, but not those dividends because dividends are not an expense. And then for our statement of cash flows, we're going to use the data in the cash column. So I've kind of framed our, our summary of transactions here to show you how you're going to use these different columns to help you. What about the statement of changes in equity, though? Don't worry, I'm going to walk you through that, and it's really going to be breaking down these two columns, common stock and retained earnings, and I'm going to walk you through how to do the statement of changes in equity as well. So what's the first financial statement? Do you remember? The income statement, I hope that's what you said. So the income statement shows revenue minus expense equals net income. Can you do it in your head? Revenue minus expense equals net income. Did it look like this in your head? So in any financial statement, we start with the company's name at the top. Then we label which financial statement it is. This is our income statement. And it's for the year ended December 31st, year one. So it goes from January 1st through December 31st, year one. And then we put in our revenue. We subtract our expenses. Now, if we have multiple different expenses, we could have many different expense lines in here. And we want to name those expenses as accurately as we can um, as we go forward with homework exercises and problems, you'll see different things come up. They'll label rent expense, salaries expense, insurance expense, supplies expense. In this case, they had just lumped everything together and they referred to it as operating expenses. So this time we just have one expense line, but it's very possible that you'll have numerous expense lines. So revenue, rental revenue minus operating expense equals our net income of $35,000. So you've done your first financial statement. We did our income statement together. What comes next? Statement of changes in stockholders' equity. And there's a reason that we do the statements in order. So in the statement of changes in stockholders' equity, we are essentially breaking down the two columns, common stock and retained earnings. And we do it in order because we're going to end up using the net income from our income statement and it's going to tie in down here on our statement of changes in equity. So think of it as a tale of two columns. I'm going to jump back to the summary of transactions, a tale of two columns. We're going to break down everything under stockholders equity. So I could say once upon a time, I started the year with zero in common stock. And then during the year, I issued $120,000 of common stock, and therefore my ending common stock is $120,000. And then I move on to my next column, retained earnings. So I started the year with zero in retained earnings. During the year, I had net income of $35,000, and then I paid out dividends of $4,000, so I only have ending retained earnings of $31,000. Let's go back to the statement because it shows pretty much exactly that. We start with zero common stock, we issued 120, and therefore we end up with ending common stock of 120,000. We start the year with zero retained earnings, we add in our net income. 
So it connects from the income statement down to here. And then we subtract the dividends that we paid out and we get our ending retained earnings of 31,000 and therefore total stockholders equity, common stock plus retained earnings is 151,000. I get students that ask all the time, do I have to memorize all these words over here? Do I have to know all this? Well, again, I don't need you to memorize it, but if you just walk through those two columns, beginning, what happened during the year, and ending. Beginning retained earnings, what happened during the year, which is our net income minus our dividends, and we get our ending retained earnings. It's not so much about memorization as it is about understanding how to read that accounting equation and using it to explain to us what happened during the year. This concept that net income then connects here to our statement of changes in stockholders' equity, that's called articulation. And you'll hear me use that term somewhat often. And really simply, it just means the, the connections among the financial statements, um, the interrelationships or the connections among our financial statements. So this is the first one we see where net income ties into our statement of changes in equity. And then these numbers here our ending common stock, ending retained earnings, and total stockholders' equity, we're going to see those over again on the balance sheet. So we'll see more articulation there. And of course, the balance sheet is our next financial statement. There it is. Now, the balance sheet is one that I hope that you don't struggle with too much. Um, I don't want to make it sound too easy because I know for some of you it will be a challenge. But if you go back to the summary of transactions. These numbers in red across the bottom literally are the balance sheet. We're going to list them out in order. We're going to start with cash plus land equals 551,000. And then we're going to show our liabilities of 400,000 plus stockholders equity, which will break out into common stock and retained earnings. And we're going to show it on the balance sheet that it all balances. So we've got cash and land, and then we put our total assets here to the right. We have our liabilities, there was only one of them, so they stuck that in the right column. And then under stockholders equity, we've got common stock and retained earnings. Those are the numbers that we already dealt with on the statement of changes in equity. And we get our total stockholders equity. We add up our liabilities and our equity, and we have total liabilities plus equity of 551,000. And traditionally, you can't really see it here because they've got grid lines, but traditionally in accounting, we double underline our total assets and our total stockholders' equity, excuse me, our total liabilities plus stockholders' equity to confirm that it balances, that 551,000 equals 551,000. Um, some of you might be wondering about the two columns. We don't need two columns to do a balance sheet or any other financial statement. It's really just for aesthetics. It's just to make it easier to read. So they put the accounts in the left column and then the total to the right. The accounts in the left column and the total to the right. So really that's just to make it a little bit easier to read, a little bit easier on the eyes. There's really no function to it. So then our next task is to prepare the statement of cash flows. Now this one, we need to learn a little bit more before we're ready for that. Um, as far as the textbook and the slides are concerned, they say, here, just do it. It's easy. Mm, I know better than that. It's not easy. We need to study a little bit before we can figure out where these numbers go. So here we have the classification for our statement of cash flows. On our statement of cash flows, we're going to have operating activities, investing activities, and financing activities. And um, I think I'll start from the bottom up. I'm not going to give you definitions, but really more explanations as to what goes into each of these three categories. If we're talking about financing activities, it always has to do with investors and creditors. So any money in or out in relation to investors or creditors. So they give us the example borrowing money from the bank, issuing stock repaying borrowed funds or paying out dividends. So we could have money coming in, borrowing money, 
issuing stock, or we could have money going out, paying back a lender, paying out dividends. And there's more examples of financing activities that we haven't come across yet. We'll talk about them later in the semester. But financing activities always has to do with investors and creditors. Then we move on to investing activities. Now, just for clarification, investing activities don't have anything to do with the investors. Remember, the investors are down here under financing activities. Investing activities is referring to how our company is investing cash into long-term assets. So investing activities are always gonna have to do with buying and selling long-term assets. So buying land, selling land. Those would be examples that would fit in this category. Buying buildings, buying equipment, trucks, computers, machinery. So buying or selling long-term assets. And then to put it simply, operating activities are everything else. So if it doesn't have to do with investors and creditors under financing, and it doesn't have to do with buying and selling long-term assets under investing activities, then it must be an operating activity. To be a little more specific, it's all the cash inflows and outflows that go along with running our business from doing what we're in business to do. So inflows would include money in from customers or clients, depending on what type of business we run. Um, outflows would include all of uh, payments for all of our expenses, um, paying our rent, paying our utilities, all of those expenses that we encounter in the normal operation of our business. Um, later we'll learn a bit about inventory, so it could include paying our suppliers that provide us with our inventory. Um, but most things will fall under operating activities because there's a lot of those transactions. And then a handful of things will go under investing and financing. And what you'll hear in accounting, as I've already mentioned, we tend to abbreviate and use a lot of acronyms. So you'll hear me refer to OA, which is operating activity, IA, which is investing activity, and FA, which is financing activity. So when we prepare a statement of cash flows, um, it breaks it into those three sections. A little bit hard to read here. At the, at the top, we have our cash flow from operating activities. Uh, in the middle, we have our cash flow from investing activities. And then down toward the bottom, we have our cash flow from financing activities. And if we add those up, our cash flow from operating, investing, and financing, what we should find out is that it mathematically works out with our beginning and ending cash. So anytime you do a statement of cash flows, first, I wanna encourage you to start at the bottom. I would like for you to start with these bottom two lines, which is our ending cash and our beginning cash, and then you can mathematically in, uh, compute the net change in cash. So if we go back to our summary of transactions, I know you don't wanna keep jumping back and forth here, but it's important. We know our beginning cash balance is zero, we know our ending cash balance is 51,000. So what's our net change in cash? How do you get from zero to 51? Sounds like a change of 51,000. So on our statement of cash flows, that's exactly what we've got. Ending, beginning, and a net change of 51,000. And then the rest of our work should also agree to that 51,000. But let's go back and run through our transactions and label the different cash flow types. So let's quickly go through each of these and we'll decide if it's OA, IA, or FA. So we get $120,000 cash from issuing stock. So that would be, I hope you said FA, it's money from investors. So money in from investors and creditors would be FA, financing activity. Second one, we get $400,000 cash from borrowing from a creditor. So again, FA, money in from a creditor, goes under financing activities. And again, these are the underlying financers of our business. How did we get the money to start our business? Well, it came from investors who put their money in in the form of common stock and creditors that loaned us $400,000. Let's keep going. 
Number three, we pay out $500,000 to purchase land. So we're buying a long-term asset. We'll learn a lot more about long-term assets later, but I can assure you land is one of them. So using cash to buy land would be an investing activity. Remember, buying and selling long-term assets is always going to be IA, investing activities. Then in number four, remember we earned $85,000. Remember that was revenue. Where do you think that goes? OA, operating activities. So that's money coming in from doing what we're in business to do. That is why we exist. That is why we operate. So $85,000 of OA. Then we pay out $50,000 for expenses. So $50,000 going out. And again, that's operating activity. Unfortunately, paying those operating expenses is normal part of running our business. And that is operating activity, OA. And then finally, we use $4,000 cash to pay dividends. Where do you think that goes? Who do we pay dividends to? We pay dividends to our stockholders, also called investors. So remember, anything having to do with creditors and investors would go under financing activities, the financers of our business, our investors and creditors. So number six is going to be F-A. So we started at the bottom. We know our beginning and ending cash. We know we have a net change in cash of 51000 And then we just have to organize these six transactions into the correct categories. So let's see what that looks like now that we have a better understanding of those three categories. So under OA, we show our revenue and our expenses. And we get... $35,000 in cash flows. And our revenue and our expenses came in cash. We received $85,000. We paid out $50,000 for expenses. So our net cash flow from operating activities is $35,000. Then under investing, we had one outflow, $500,000 to purchase land. And then under financing, we borrowed $400,000 from the bank. We issued stock, so those are both positive numbers. And then we paid out a dividend of $4,000. So if we add all of that up, we get net cash flow from financing of five sixteen. So if we take $35,000 minus $500,000 plus $516,000, mathematically, we also arrive at $51,000. So as you're doing the statement of cash flows, again, I'm reminding you, I want you to start at the bottom and arrive at net change in cash, in this case, 51,000. And then your work, OA plus IA plus FA, should verify that number is correct. It's a pretty good sign that we've done something right. It doesn't guarantee perfection, but it means we did a pretty good job. And again, this connection with the beginning and ending cash, this ending cash number is what appears on our balance sheet. So yet another example of articulation, that inner relationship among the financial statements. So that's your four financial statements. I know the statement of cash flows is a little bit tricky, requires a little bit of extra study there of the different classifications, but I have every confidence that with a little practice you can get it. Finally, that brings us to the closing process. So after we prepare our financial statements, then we close out what's called the temporary accounts. So let me explain what temporary accounts mean. And we're going to go over this again in chapter two. So this is just an introduction to this concept. We're going to talk about it more in chapter two. And then we're actually going to do it in chapter three. So they say we want to close out our temporary accounts. And temporary accounts are those that track our financial results for a limited period of time. And what falls in that category is revenue expenses and dividends. Now we've grouped those three things together before, right? Those are all the things that go under retained earnings, revenue expense and dividends. And then our permanent accounts are the ones that track our results from year to year. That's ALO. That's our accounting equation. Assets equal liabilities plus stockholders equity. Let me jump back to our accounting equation and just mark this for you. 
Remember this way back on slide 31, we had our accounting equation and we expanded it into our allo tree. And I just want to mark for you um, what temporary and permanent accounts mean in this context. So I'm going to draw a line here. I'm going to try to draw a line here. Let's try again. these accounts down here are what we call temporary. So all the things that are under retained earnings in this red box down here, those are all temporary. So that includes revenue, expense, and dividends. And at the end of the period, those three are all going to get closed out into retained earnings. That's why when we record transactions, we record them under the retained earnings column. So when we record our revenue, we know it's eventually going to have an impact on retained earnings and expenses and dividends. We record them under the retained earnings column because they're eventually going to have an impact on retained earnings. But I want to be very careful and thoughtful with my words there. They eventually, at the end of the period, they go into retained earnings. So through the closing process at the end is when they technically arrive in retained earnings. And I'm pointing this out because in your homework, pretty sure you're going to run across a question where they're going to ask something like, what is the balance in retained earnings after transaction number four? And you're going to be doing all your work and you're going to go and look, okay, after transaction number four, I have $85,000 in retained earnings. Hmm. And you're going to find out, no, that's wrong. But you're going to say, but I see it with my own eyes. I see $85,000. It's in retained earnings. And the technical answer is the balance of retained earnings immediately after event four is zero. This $85,000 that we see there doesn't technically arrive there until the closing process. Okay. If that's confusing to you, don't worry. We're going to keep going over this idea of temporary accounts in the closing process again in Chapter 2, and then we're going to actually do it in Chapter 3. So don't worry, but I've put that idea out there that the numbers you see in the retained earnings column aren't actually there yet. They arrive there through the closing process at the end of the period. So going back to our diagram, these ones down here are all temporary, revenue, expense, and dividends. And then ALO, including common stock and retained earnings as well, those are our permanent accounts that they roll forward from one period to the next. So your cash balance at the end of 2019 becomes your cash balance at the beginning of 2020. Oh, yep, yeah, and that goes for your liabilities, too. Maybe you were hoping they might get wiped out. Start the new year fresh. Take the liabilities away. Nope, those roll forward, too. So all these numbers roll forward into the next year. Those are permanent accounts. We don't reset them back to zero. Where revenue, expenses, and dividends, we reset them back to zero, and we essentially dump their balances all into retained earnings through the closing process. In your homework, you might see what's called the horizontal financial statements model. And I know we didn't use it today, but I'm going to introduce it just briefly so it doesn't take you by surprise. And these are our same seven transactions from RCS recorded in the horizontal financial statements model. And really what it is, if you look from here to here where they've labeled balance sheet, that's our accounting equation. That's as much as we did. But then they expand that out to the right and they give us columns for the income statement. So anytime we put something under retained earnings, it should also go under the income statement if it's revenue or expense. Mm, I already see a mistake here. Let's fix it. Did you see that mistake too? So under retained earnings, we have 85,000 and that was revenue. Anytime we put something under retained earnings, 
we need to ask ourselves, is that revenue, expense, or dividends? So for the 85,000, it belongs here in the revenue column, which is gonna impact revenue on our income statement. And then that one transaction is gonna cause our net income to go up by 85,000. Here we have negative 50,000 under retained earnings. That represented expenses. So it goes here in the expense column, and that one transaction will cause our net income to go down by 50,000. And then finally, we had minus 4,000 or negative 4,000. That was when we paid out dividends. And remember, dividends are not an expense, so it doesn't impact the income statement. Dividends don't belong on the income statement, so it's NA. But having this expanded format essentially allows us to already have our income statement done by the time we finish going through our transactions. Then finally, over here on the far right in green, we have our statement of cash flows, where each item that involved cash from our cash column, we rewrite those numbers over here and we label them each with their cash flow type, OA, IA, or FA. So remember, we already walked through each of the, these. And of course, number seven didn't involve any cash, so it's NA, not applicable. There was no cash involved. But what this does is if we analyze all of this information as we go through our transactions, it really eases the process of preparing our financial statements. So our income statement would be pretty much done here under net income. Our balance sheet would be the sum of the numbers across the bottom here. And then our statement of changes in equity, we still have to grab the numbers from the common stock and retained earnings columns. And then finally, our statement of cash flows would come from over here on the far right. We've got everything already labeled OAIAFA, and we're ready to prepare the statement of cash flows as well. So a little bit more work as we analyze our seven transactions, but really useful when it comes to preparing financial statements. You should see some of that in your chapter one homework. So hopefully you can get used to it, but don't worry, we'll go over it in class too. When it comes to financial reports, um, we're gonna start out by studying transactions and financial statements for service type businesses. And they give us examples, doctors, attorneys, um, it could be, plumbing, it could be an auto mechanic, it could be a hairstylist, all of those would be considered service businesses. We're selling our knowledge, our time, our services, and uh, rather than a product. Then we get into merchandising businesses. They sell stuff. Sometimes, um, sometimes some of these service businesses might also sell some items as well, so they might be a little bit blended. Um, but we'll learn about merchandising businesses when we get to chapter four. And then finally, manufacturing businesses, that's when we both make the stuff and then we sell stuff. So it'd be a manufacturing or a factory type setting. And that's a little more complicated beyond the scope of this course, but we'll tackle that in managerial accounting. So, Businesses are gonna be required to issue financial statements and specifically publicly traded companies, those that are traded on a stock exchange, have to issue what's called an annual report. So they have to issue formal financial statements accompanied by an annual report to their investors each year. And prospective investors might be interested in reading this. And it's gonna include financial statements, notes to the financial statement, an auditor's, auditor's report, which we're going to learn about later, and it also includes management's discussion and analysis, or MDNA for short. Um, going way back, companies used to make really fancy booklets and expensive annual reports with color pictures and graphs and spend a lot of money printing and distributing such things. Now it's pretty much all done online, and they issue them in... Uh, essentially by providing it on their website. But beyond that, they have to submit these annual reports to the government in what's called a Form 10-K. And we'll learn how to access a company's annual report online. You have access to all publicly traded companies' annual reports for free online. And we'll learn how to do that in Chapter 3.
When we get to chapter three, I definitely encourage you to um, take a look and get online and we'll learn how to access those annual reports and look at real world financial statements of companies that might be of interest to you because really the best way to learn accounting is to use it and apply it. So we'll try to put that to work here soon. Whew, that was a lot of information. That is the end of chapter one. Thank you for staying with me. I know this is um, a long lecture, but I hope it's something that maybe you could mark certain slides or certain minutes in the lecture and refer back to the parts that are confusing to you. Of course, please feel free to ask me any questions. I will talk to you in class soon.